Hello, everyone. <laughs> Sam Ekman here with Gold Derby with the incredible visual effects team from Kingdom of the Planet of the Apes. We have Eric Winquist, Paul Story, Stephen Unterfranz, and Stuart Adcock. Uh, gentlemen, this is already, you know, this these films are known for groundbreaking visual effects. Uh, and even though there is the spectacle that we expect with an action film, I always feel when I watch these apes movies, this one in particular especially, is that the humanity of the characters really is what comes through the most, even more than any kind of explosion uh, or chase scene. So how does that working on the humanity of a digital character feel different to you? Does that feel like it's a, a centered aspect of these films? I mean, I would say that that's that's why we enjoy working on these as as much as we do. I mean, if it was if it was pure spectacle, there's certainly a technical challenge in executing that kind of work. But without the the actual soul of the performances, the you know being able to take what we got from the actors that we were working with on set and and kind of faithfully translate those performances into what you see on screen, um, ultimately you're left with a slightly the hollow experience. It's it's like the yeah, you know, it's the it's the it's the the hollow junk food version of the film instead of something that really the, the protein you know that really gives you something to remember you know when you leave the the cinema. Yeah, and maybe just to add to that as well, it's 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 often about restraint with animation. You know, the 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 actors actually do a lot of that in their their own performances. You know, they're not they're not just playing themselves; they're playing uh, a restrained version of dialogue, and and it's so it starts with their process really bringing that to the table and then it's for us to pin on that and and restrain our animation so it feels authentic and believable you know i think i always believe a lot of the time animation is always better when it's 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 that it's that it's all about that restraint trying to to make it hit the right balance and it's always a balance of art and science to get this thing right yeah well i want to talk about uh working with those actors too because I know for this process, there was a, a really heavy emphasis on practical sets and, and real locations when I know motion capture is traditionally done more in a studio setting. So how do you know, what does that process change for you with motion capture when you're not in a studio? Well, I think, I mean, the, the thing that's been great about going into this, about going into Kingdom is that we had, you know, the three prior films under our belts as well, which all took took advantage of this performance capture on location uh, sort of approach to the, the process. And so, um, you know, it, it is true that so much of it historically, like the, the motion capture process has been in, a, in the constraints of a very confined, uh, not confined, but just a climate controlled, you know, sort of more comfortable space. And suddenly, you, you know, in, in the case of this film, we found ourselves, you know, having to, to deal with uh, the flora and fauna of, uh, of Australia and the, the heat of, you know, a, a pretty intense, you know, summertime um, kind of climate to deal with. Um, the having to set up all that gear and make sure we were ready to roll by the time the filmmakers are ready to to call action, um, and so there's there's a huge amount of infrastructure that we have to bring to these projects to to make that happen to to go out into a rural environment and set up all this technology, uh, but it's you know it's something that um, you know we we've got some some good experience under our belts with now, and so um, we can pretty confidently approach a given scene you know whether we're going to be by a river and what that might entail or whether we're going to be you know sort of you know in a night scene uh kind of a long way from the city um they all sort of have a slightly unique approach that we're going to need to consider when we come into these projects but um you know it, it ultimately the effort that that takes you know really does come through and what you see in the final product and so it does seem you know for the for these kind of shows it's a really great way to attack that problem mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think um, just to jump straight to one of my favorite shots, there's a scene where Rock is in the water and the original capture for that is in the tank. He's actually getting swamped with water, Peter Macon, um, and it's all very realistic. At some point, we changed the line and, uh, and the delivery and actually the words spoken. So clearly, principle is over by then and... Um, you know, we did a capture on the stage and we actually recorded a line, just Peter recorded it himself and sent it through. And so when we did the when we did the final performance of that, the, the capture carried the sort of emotive um, message that we wanted to convey, but it missed little subtle involuntary 
beats that were happening in the water tank. So, you know, I, I guess all that to say, like, we're not too purist about like, oh, well, that was the capture from the day or this is the capture from the volume, you know, and then we have actual artist hands go in and combine the best of both of those things. So we get the little eye blinks and the little gasps and stuff that we see in the tank. But then we also carry through the delivery of the line in the performance where Peter was able to just really focus on what it means to to be saying this, um, which I think is really cool. Hmm. Yeah, well, speaking of what I'm sure must have lots of little beats is uh, dialogue, because we're used to the apes using a lot of sign language and some limited speaking, but they are really a fully vocal species in this movie, which I imagine mm -hmm. uh, has a whole new set of challenges on your end. So what is what is that process like of getting an animal to speak and having that look realistic? Well, I guess, you know, we're, we're obviously using the... Um the the performance it's it's key that we get that um that emotional performance through first uh, i think in any sort of um any, any sort of dialogue take but yeah we, we're using like two two setups we've got the um full animation but then also our dls um system as well so our dls system is the the solver we use the facial cameras and record um the the performance and that gets translated through an actor puppet and then onto um onto our character puppet and having um, the the actor puppet, obviously his range is is different to our, our character puppet. So we just need to make sure that we're sort of dialing in those ranges to to make it feel like it's realistic to that ape character. I was going to say like the technology side of it, you know, on on our end is one thing, but I think even backing up further, there was the that that point in in prep on the film where all of the cast essentially had to find their voice as well, you know, um, and, you know, we had a moment in, in the early kind of the, the, the week leading up to, or two weeks leading up to whatever it was, uh, the actual start of photography where they all got on a, on a zoom with Andy circus. And it was really like a, a passing of the baton, you know, to the new generation of apes, uh, of, of hearing from, you know, hearing from Caesar himself, um, how he found like where he was, he was actually channeling his, his, ape, his ape voice from, um, and and getting getting notes on their the actual you know, body mechanics and their their movement and that kind of stuff from from uh, you know a, a legend in in the franchise um, and so it all started there of, of them being able to actually communicate and you know find a way to to convey this idea that yes they're speaking now but the biology still doesn't make it easy for them like it it, it would for a human mm -hmm. being and so it all starts from that and from on you know on top of that uh the solver you know the essentially as this is the kind of base layer of the movement the animation on the facial uh, side of things that we see but then on top of that the facial animators then need to come in and sort of look at and assess what's working you know what's communicating the emotion of that moment you know faithfully and honestly and what we what we may need to do to make some some adjustments to sort of make that sing even more yeah, yeah and, and I, I wouldn't underestimate the the build of the character in that process as well because you know what you see on screen is the end product but it's had months and months of evolution to get that character puppet emotionally you know all the beats reading from our, our actors so we go through a long process at the start where a lot of it there is all keyframes because it's it's more agile we can be more freeform to to get stuff in front of where's early that he he feels his character and a lot of challenges like for example apes don't have eyebrows they don't have classic um, brow mus muscles like we do so we have to look at all these ideas of okay how do we have the empathy in noah where we might not read his brows as clearly, but we can see the the pull on his on his eyelids, and we can read the white of his eyes and the shape of the white of his eyes. So we know the audience will then read that as feeling like empathy or sympathetic. Mm. So all these little cues about seeing nasolabial furrow lines again, apes typically don't have them, but if we don't have them in our performance, something's a bit missing. So our animators are constantly kind of riding this. Um, line between what's anatomically plausible for an ape and what's anatomically plausible for a human, and every any given shot is a is a is a balance uh, of this. And um, uh, yeah, I can't underestimate underestimate how important it is to to get the puppet right. It's our instrument yeah. as animators. We're kind of you know musicians, and <laughs> and our puppet is our instrument. So we really need to get that firing well. And then it, the pursuit, as Eric said, is always to to match the actor's performance. We're translating that onto the onto the ape. Mm. 
Um, I guess part of that too comes down to the design of the characters as well, like introducing part of that actor onto the actual design of the character as well. You know, there's certain parts of the face where we might might not be able to sort of sell that emotional performance if we don't have a little bit more human and like, you know, how the cheeks sort of rise and, and give that sort of um, emotional performance around the eyes that you wouldn't otherwise get from from an ape. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And there's the there's the all the things that these guys are talking about where you where you're adding to get it to that level that that humanity that you're talking about. But then there's also some early sort of decisions that you have to make that is this going to be in displacement or is this going to be in the base mesh because the base mesh can't be infinitely dense and then you get into production and you start seeing the the character and noah does a lot of uh you know the the muzzle puff kind of move and it stretches that surface out and you know just just by way of example we had wrinkles in there that weren't quite deforming properly and it was actually i think a few of us found it a bit distracting you know that it was that it was sort of eroding some of the realism there was just something not quite right there so we went back in and and made the mesh denser through that space so that those wrinkles could actually um stretch and 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 compress um more realistically and that was that was once we were into shots you know and it's just Mm kind of you just kind of have to pick your battles and figure out what's going to what's going to make the the best character even even as you get into those first few rubber meets the road kind of situations that's a good example actually and so about every department working together to try where the pursuit is always performance and and if we're finding that we've got all these expressions in animation where all of the creases and the wrinkle folds are helping to sell an emotion but maybe in the look dev the fur is covering some of these or maybe going against the grain then we're not working cohesively together. So we try our best to always put performance first and chase every little detail that we can. There's there's the, the simplified version of the production model that we tend to talk about where the, the modelers build the model and then look dev artists put textures and shaders on that and they sort of make it look like real skin and then it, it's handed off to animation. But it's, it's never this assembly line process. You're essentially doing all of those things up until the last month or three of, of the show where you're continuing to find moments that 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 challenge what your assumptions were about how the character was going to need to behave and the kind of things you needed to support in the character uh and and continually just sort of you know adding and improving and, and kind of tweaking it as you go yeah in fact i don't think noah was done until, yeah. until maybe the last shot in the movie because every shot you come across a new emotional challenge or maybe you need to right. to be more animalistic and suddenly we're now referring to more ape reference of how he can sneer and snarl and show his fangs. And so, you know, it's an evolution process, definitely. Yeah. Well, evolution and, and, is a, an appropriate theme yeah. for this movie. <laughs> yeah, not, not, and I just want to add on to that, not to linger on this one question, but I, I think it, I think it's worth saying to emphasize, Stu, what you were saying about, you know, and, and, and Eric about it not being an assembly line. I, I think when there's, when there's such a huge volume of work to get through, the the sort of emergent tendency is towards the like i'm gonna do my part and keep moving and i think we we did a we took some some sort of steps that were a little bit scary to kind of apply the brakes just a little bit and keep everybody more involved so that everybody was kind of on the same page even if we were talking about the fur you know the the look dev guys were there and and you know, just just by way of example, that everybody kind of knew what was going on, so that we could, you know, nip those in the bud. Those those scenarios where something, you know, one person's work might cover up somebody else's work. Mm-hmm. And what's crazy for me to think about is you're describing such hyper detailed work, and then you have moments like there's two huge water sequences. Uh, there's the flooding and the fight scene in water. So you've created this uh, intricately detailed character, then have to get him wet. So how do you, uh, you know, approach kind of having these characters interact with elements like that? Um, there was one of those things that was pretty, it was there in the, in the, the first draft of the script that I'd read. And you, it was very apparent that these were some of the challenges we were going to have to be addressing on this show. The nice thing was we had just, well, at the time we were still still working on, had, had come off the back of Avatar The Way of Water, where a lot of those challenges were 
not to the same degree. I mean, we didn't have very hairy characters in the water, but there was still the need to support that idea that a character would come out of the water. You would see the little thin film rivulets of water dripping down their skin. Uh, that water would going to have to affect the hair that they did have and, and those kind of things. And so there was a lot of uh, you know years worth of, of work in those areas already that we knew there was at least a fundamental tool set that we were going to be able to draw upon for this show. Um, it's just that this this film sort of pushed some of those ideas, uh, you know, pushed the technology further than we had to take it potentially on on the that other show. Um, but it, it's it's one of those things that you know you you attack it from the beginning, and I think it's the fact that we had that going in was. Um, you know, I was going to say a reason why I was able to, you know, lose less sleep than I otherwise would have, you know, in the early days of the show is knowing that there was the experience uh, of the effects team, of the creatures team that have to work together very closely in these kind of scenarios. Um, you know, these flooding shots tended to have, again, the same kind of thing where there's, there's not just a simple assembly line. There's a lot of back and forth and iteration going on where uh effects maybe does a first pass of here's what the water is doing here's what we think the current is going to be in this scene or the shot animation here you go here's a rough uh, a low res approximation of of that water surface for you know so that these guys can then take that throw an ape into that mix and and maybe that was you know uh, an actor who was captured in a rolling office chair on a motion capture stage you know being being swept away by the current and playing that that whole event we drop them into that thing into the low res and you know, get that, get the blocking of that working for Wes. Uh, yeah, this is how this is going to to dance with the cameras as the character drifts by on the current. But then when that has to then go back to the effects department and back to the creatures department to sort of upres the water simulation, and that water simulation has to sort of work with the hair uh, and and our hair and the water and the fire and everything else. They're all uh, simulated through a unified simulation framework, which is great because it means we can do these kind of things that are these coupled simulations where the hair affects the water and the water affects the hair uh, as, as we get into these kind of these shots. Um, and so, you know, be, between that, between the the wetness that has to then also flow into the the look depth side of things and actually affect the way the shader behaves and make the skin look wet. Uh, the multiple layers of back and forth to get the droplets in the hair that's been affected by the water sim. That's, you know, it's like these very kind of interconnected, uh, intricate workflows that require a lot of, uh, a lot of communication, um, mm. you know, between various departments to, to pull off. Yeah. And it also affects performance as well like in some instances you know like talking about the rackers shot mm. where he filmed his new performance even on his iphone and um, we'd sort of go back in there and like with the mist and stuff that's happening with the water or droplets coming down on his eyes you know we add an extra blinks and that sort of thing to help sort of make that connection a little more real i guess yeah and you kind of you kind of skin the onion like like that shot and a number of other shots where it's like okay this is, here's the river this is what the river's doing here's a here's a low res version of it you know per per frame so the animation can then go place raka now here's the here's the creature bake of raka what does that do to the river and then you know as the river runs around the animation of raka now we you know the the ping pong goes back to the other side and it says oh, oh okay well now now that localized effect that he has on the water that water is going to drench his fur and his skin and spray on his face based on the animation which is based on the river and hmm. it, it, you know you you just kind of you have to sort of pick a place to to stop drilling down but <laughs> but, but we got i i supervised the team during the last year of of way of water and so when we came into this i had a couple of sequences where there's plate water right in amongst the the cg water where we're enhancing it or sort of altering what it's doing and you know we definitely I, I hate this phrase, but we took it to the next level. Um, you know, we got into we got into working out like how much aeration is changing as the as the water is thinning out. And there's a you know there's one shot where where we've got the water rendered with higher aeration and with lower aeration, and we're doing the transition, and we just can't quite get it dialed in as it's thinning out to happen in one render. So again, you see the hand of the artist in the shot where they're actually you know, on a few frames here and there, they're painting through the two different renders 
to get that transition from more to less aerated just right. So it's like all the technology is this whole big scaffold, but still standing on the top of the scaffold is an artist taking it that last three, five percent, you know, to push it over the edge. Um, pretty good summary for every part, yeah, of, the, yeah. every part of our process really yeah, yeah. yeah. taking it's, it over the edge it's a good uh, <laughs> i don't think we can top that um well all so that i use taking is, it over the edge and i used um taking it taking it to the next level i'm, I'm cut off now <laughs> <laughs> well <clears throat> thank you gentlemen so much uh all the painstaking work is definitely worth it uh because it's a beautiful looking film beautiful looking work so thank you all for joining me and make sure everyone watching sticks with Gold Derby the rest of this season. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.